WNEV TV, Boston. This is News 7, New England. Good evening, everyone. Artie is off tonight. Topping News 7, environmental officials in Rhode Island and California breathe sighs of relief. Shipping accidents on both coasts that could have caused widespread devastation have not. A cargo ship that ran aground today in Narragansett Bay has been safely refloated with minimal spill. And in California, Quick Response and Mother Nature have combined to save the shores of Huntington Beach so far. Cleanup crews floated containment booms into place today, working to protect the wildlife preserve and beaches from the 340,000 gallons of Alaskan crude that spilled from the tanker, polluting an eight-square-mile area. A freak swell pushed the American trader onto one of its own anchors yesterday, punching a hole in the hull during a routine mooring two miles offshore. Luckily, the Santa Ana winds have pushed the spill out to sea, giving oil skimmers a chance to clean it up. The weather is favorable right now. We know where the spill is. The spill is not completely surrounded by a boom. That's not possible. Officials say the spill is nothing like the devastating Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska, except for the reaction from environmentalists. It's a terrible thing. This happened right offshore. I'm very upset. So Valdez has come to Southern California, folks, and nothing has changed. But one thing that has changed is the response time. Coast Guard Admiral Paul Yost left Washington first thing today for a helicopter tour of the damage. The Bush administration was criticized for taking four days to respond to the Valdez spill. I think we're much more uh, attuned in the, uh, the, uh, to oil spills than we were before the Exxon Valdez and three or four other major spills. Uh, the president is certainly concerned. The Southern California spill is one thirtieth the size of the Valdez disaster. As for the damage to wildlife, nine birds have been killed, 12 others oiled. Closer to home, in Rhode Island's Narragansett Bay, a cargo ship with 3,000 cars on board has been refloated tonight and moved to its port of destination, Davisville, after losing its steering and running aground today off Jamestown. The Norwegian ship, Huel and Greta, rammed a fishing boat and pier and has spilled at most 100 gallons of fuel. The cargo ship was damaged in a storm from France during its sea crossing. Now that it has been towed to Davisville, the 3,000 Saabs and Mercedes on board will be offloaded tomorrow and the investigation into the accident will continue. Well, a double murder in Dorchester this morning, the beating death last week of a gay man, just two incidents in a year that has already given 16 lives to murder in our city streets. News 7's Miles O'Brien reports that guns and violence have taken their toll not only in lives, but in the vitality of Boston's neighborhoods. The gunshots leave more than flesh wounds behind. An entire community is bleeding, bleeding away its spirit and confidence. Lord, we're just a circle of concern here. The circle and the concern continue to grow. At this meeting, a handful of residents listened to some safety tips from Boston police. Too late for Myra Kirkland to avoid a recent robbery. Because now, when I walk down the streets, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I mean, it's, it takes away your sense of security. On Stanwood Street, their sense of security has been badly shaken once again. In the morning, police removed the bodies of two young men shot and killed execution style. I think Eddie was uh, uh, at the wrong place at the wrong time, even though he was in his house. 30-year-old George Georgeoff was walking through a Dorchester park to his house last Wednesday night when he was stoned to death. Police have arrested one juvenile and are seeking another. Georgeoff was homosexual, and some in the gay community say police should see if his sexual orientation was a motive. I saw George in the hospital. Um, he was severely beaten. Um, it seems like there was more to it than simple robbery. We have no uh, evidence whatsoever that would indicate that this incident was other than um, a robbery, homicide. But for the people living amid this crime wave, perception is every bit as important as reality. And the perception is there are real reasons to be afraid. In Roxbury, Miles O'Brien, News 7. The Boston police say the Community Disorders Unit is continuing its investigation of last week's beating death of George George F. Three and a half months after the murder of Carol Stewart and one month after the apparent hoax of Chuck Stewart is revealed, a state judiciary committee is now deciding whether to appoint a special commission to investigate the case. Today, those for and against the commission testified on Beacon Hill. 
Both argued many questions remain, but they disagreed on who should search for the answers. These charges include the possibility that cultural and racial and sexual biases may have inappropriately narrowed the investigation's focus, and that the civil rights, especially of African-American males, may have been violated during the investigation. Fifteen separate agencies now investigate the Boston police, state and federal, elected, non-elected. And I ask a, a question in all good sincerity. What will a 16th do? The Judiciary Committee will go into executive session later this month, review the testimony, and make a decision on the commission. Mark? Well, he may have a few new songs on the charts, a few new names in the band, but it's still the same Paul McCartney who's been charming audiences for more than a quarter of a decade. And tonight is opening night at the Worcester Centrum for Paul McCartney. That's where we also find New 7's arts and entertainment reporter Debbie Emblem. How's the show, Debbie? Well, Mark, I've been grinning ever since I got here. The show is far, far better than I expected it to be, as a matter of fact. It's pretty quiet right now. The fans left about 10.20, but uh, I think... All in all, you could say that it might just turn out to be one of the very best concerts of the year. Um, they did a set from the Beatles, and that particularly had the crowd on their feet tonight. A really wonderful, nostalgic kind of night. I was reflecting back to my childhood when I used to have this Paul McCartney Beatles doll, so that, that tells you the, the mindset we're all in tonight. Um, at age 47, McCartney really still can kick out the jams. I uh, basically can tell you this, there was at least two hours of jam-packed hot tunes tonight from Paul McCartney and his five-member band, and I will definitely have a full review for you coming up a little bit later on News 7. Back to you. Good, Debbie. Thanks. We'll look forward to hearing from you a little bit later on. Kate? Tonight, the U.S. State Department is warning of possible Iranian terrorist attacks this weekend. The state's government is deeply concerned that terrorists may now be planning an operation against U.S. interests in Western Europe which may be timed for on or about February 11th. February 11th marks the 11th anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. Today's warning is based on intelligence reports that the pro-Iranian group Hezbollah is planning an attack. But the State Department says its information is vague, so vague, in fact, that the CIA didn't think it was worth warning the public about. But the State Department, harshly criticized for not warning about terrorist threats before Pan Am 103's bombing, decided to err on the side of caution. The Pentagon today released new videotape of the U.S. invasion of Panama. The pictures were shot by a camera aboard an AC-130 gunship in the early morning hours of December 20th. The aircraft circled Manuel Noriega's headquarters, then opened fire with a 105-millimeter howitzer and a 40-millimeter cannon. In another scene, a cannon scores a direct hit on a Panamanian armored personnel carrier. The Pentagon says the tapes were censored to remove sensitive information. As for the prosecution of Manuel Noriega, a federal judge in Miami ruled today that the former dictator can be tried on drug charges in a U.S. court, even though he is a prisoner of war and has that status. CBS News today suspended 60 Minutes commentator Andy Rooney for three months without pay. The action is in response to racial remarks he allegedly made in a gay magazine. The advocate quotes Rooney as saying that most people are born with equal intelligence, but blacks have watered down their genes because the less intelligent ones are the ones that have the most children. Rooney denies ever saying that. Not say what I was quoted as having said. It is not a phrase I would ever use. I am not a racist. I am not a bigot. After a meeting with Rooney, CBS News President David Burke said that uh, he made it clear to the commentator that CBS News cannot tolerate such remarks or anything that approximates such comments. More news ahead tonight here on News 7. We continue our investigation of the state we're in. 
I'm Hank Phillippe Ryan. Tonight, the News 7 investigators look at budget cuts, and sometimes what is lost by the cuts is a lot more than what is gained. That story coming up. The Bruins, tops in the NHL, take on the Nordiques. Down there at the bottom of the barrel at the Garden, John Dennis ahead with all the action. And we'll go back to the Worcester Centrum and hear more from Debbie Emblem and from Paul McCartney. That and much more ahead. Is it Tonight, dozens of Massachusetts mayors reeling from the Bay State cash crunch are looking for ways to stop a threatened cut in local aid. The mayors, all members of the Mass Municipal Association, met to discuss the fiscal crisis today. They're worried about the governor's promise to slash half a billion dollars in local aid if new, no new taxes are passed. Many say they'll take the state to court if that happens. Absolutely devastating and unreal to consider making any cuts that are proposed on this particular sheet that I'm holding up. It is an impossible, a fiscally impossible situation to have to deal with. Another option the mayors are considering pushing legislation that would prohibit Governor Dukakis from cutting local aid. Cuts, a word that has become one of the favorite rallying calls of candidates and critics in the state we're in. But tonight our new seven investigators reveal that some cuts are costing more than they are saving, especially in human terms. As News 7's Hank Phillippe Ryan reports, in some cases, we're losing more than we're saving when the deficit acts falls. The inspector general's office could never be described as bustling, even in the best of times. Financial oversight and analysis is normally a quiet business. But these days, officials worry it's too quiet. Empty desks don't equal savings on salaries, the IG calculates. To him, they mean no return on worthy investments. This person sat here, worked on monitoring the MWRA. Now the desk is empty. Budget cut quotas mean that analyst who resigned can't be replaced. Barassi points to this parking lot, too. Another employee in his office found it sheltered an illegal $2.3 million trust fund. $2.3 million that was, soon after, returned to the state. That employee has since left, too. Who sits there now? Nobody. It's empty. So here Wendy Haynes sits, monitoring the vast and sprawling Central Artery Project. When I was hired for this, into this position two years ago, it was my understanding and certainly the commitment of the office that there would be more than one person doing what it took to prevent waste and abuse in the Central Artery Project. Now she's essentially the only watchdog here over the $4.4 billion big dig. There are still things that we're able to do and continue to do. But every time we have to make a choice away from an area that is typically vulnerable to abuse, I can hear the door closing on an opportunity to save money. Return on investment, weakened review of the Central Artery Project. It's frustration because I know that those cuts are not cost effective as far as this office is concerned. Mapping equipment. It's still in the crates because we don't have the staff to take it out of the crate and set it up. Put this one on your cost-effective scale. A $40,000 computer system still in its box at the Department of Environmental Protection. What it's supposed to be doing is helping the DEP staff map its wetlands protection program. The dots show how far the program's gone in guarding against development that could destroy those wetlands. No dots in most of Massachusetts. Does it mean that there are no wetlands out here? Oh, no, no. There are uh, large areas um, of wetlands across the state. Um, the program just hasn't been implemented in the, re the remainder of the, uh, the areas. But because the DEP cannot now afford the staff to use the computer, one that helps them set up restrictions and levy fines, it just sits there. Where does that leave the program? Well, it leaves the program essentially ineffective, um, and it leaves us frustrated. Return on investment, a $2.5 million a year program, 10 years behind. Mental health clients like Kirk and Elizabeth depend on the state, and they are losing on the budget deal, too. Each of them is now at a pivotal time, not quite ready to be completely on their own, but way past needing the institutional regimen of the Mass Mental Health Center. It would be perfect, their counselors say, if they lived with some help on the outside, in a real house. It sounds just right. It gives you more sense of uh, being your own person, 
uh, being able to make your own decisions and things like that. It'll be mine, my apartment. And in fact, the state actually bought the homes, 16 of them like this one and this. All told, the state paid $4.3 million for them. What happened next? The budget cuts and the houses, all 16, are still empty. Kirk and Elizabeth still bunk at the mental health center. And it seems the state is out $4.3 million. That's because there's no money in the budget to pay for staff to work in those homes. What we promised and afforded families was opportunity and hope. And now what we have is we've put that on hold. It's very hard to tell a family member or a consumer, hold on, just wait a little longer uh, when they've waited all their life. Return on investment, $4.3 million in empty houses. To implement the program. It's not that there are no programs. The wetlands restriction the program still program. exists, and so do central artery oversight and mainstreaming of those in mental health centers. The programs are still there, but some say now they're really shells of programs. You not only that, with program shells, which I think happens in these cases, but you're also left with no sense of what's really important and what is less important. So you end up with this, everybody takes this, the, the hit across the board. And then does anything work? Nothing works. What Senator Songus is doing, in the higher education system at least, is calling in a group of CEO types to analyze its inner workings and see what needs to be kept and what could go. Songus told me it was certainly the first time such a thing had been done in that area, and he suggested other departments do the same. Tomorrow mark remembrances of things past and some old state programs that refuse to die. Thank you very much, Hank. Coming up next, a look at the weather. Harvey is straight ahead to tell us about the spring-like spring pattern we've gotten into. Uh, yes, with some record breakers, not quite here. Maybe pretty close tomorrow to a record-breaking high temperature for us. Let you know what the weekend's going to have in store as well. The full forecast is next. Tonight, the police are out on Bay State highways looking for more than just speeders. There's an intensive safety crackdown on trucks underway. The inspections follow the release of a federal report three days ago citing fatigue and drug abuse as the major causes of truck accidents. The Registry of Motor Vehicles says the falling number of truck crashes over the past three years here in Massachusetts makes it the model state, a role model state. Law officials report rigs of all sizes are under inspection until 2 a.m. Look at the weather forecast now. About 50 degrees here in St. Louis today. Yeah. 20 degrees warmer. Well, you're not supposed to look at my cheat sheet before I start. I can read upside down. I, I learned that over the years that. sitting next to you. <laughs> okay, that's that was what quite you have a to difference. Yeah. What the heck? It is a big difference. Mild here and warm there, and it's going to be somewhere between mild and warm here for tomorrow. The record is 59, and we may come fairly close here in the Boston area, even though the sunshine will be fading, especially in the afternoon. Lots of folks calling up saying, uh, ring around the room, uh, not the room, ring around the moon tonight. Those are the high thin cirrus clouds uh, forming that effect that you sometimes see. 40 degrees, the temperature in Boston. Not going to go down now because the wind is getting busy out of the southwest, 15 miles per hour, and the barometer is falling. And yes, indeed, most of our area today just a little bit above 50 degrees. Now, take a look at the readings now. A couple of the low lying areas, uh, Concord, New Hampshire, Poughkeepsie, New York, are getting close to the freezing mark. But where the wind is blowing out of the southwest, Temperatures are starting to actually go up and look to our south and west. It's all in the 40s to near 50 degrees. So the temperature may actually be warmer when you head out tomorrow morning than it is now. And it's going to be a very, very mild day. Now, in terms of some moisture from the west and from the south, some moisture is trying to organize. Not too much in the way of showers yet, but I expect it to blossom over the next 24 hours. And it should be very, very late tomorrow or during tomorrow night that we start to get into some showers. Now, it appears that a little storm is going to develop on this front, which will probably lock the showers in, not only for tomorrow night, but now it appears for at least a part of Saturday morning. But then as the little storm zips by, Saturday afternoon we should rapidly dry out with some partial clearing from west to east. It will be turning somewhat colder, and I do believe that Sunday will be a dry and seasonable day, the way things are shaping up. So let's get to your weekend forecast, and it goes like this. For the rest of tonight... Our skies are mainly clear. Again, those high, thin clouds just barely detectable by the ring around the moon. About 40 here in Boston, some of the low-lying areas temporarily around 30. Tomorrow, the sunniest weather will be in the morning, the clouds thickening in the afternoon. The showers might even hold off here in the Boston area until after dark, but 48 to 56. However, the winds will really pick up out of the southwest. Mild almost all night tomorrow night with showery rains. 
That means much of the remaining snow cover here, at least in extreme southern New England, will go well inland. Uh, there's so much that not all of it will. Early rain on Saturday, but looks like afternoon sunshine taking over. Cooler in the 40s, a gusty wind, and back to seasonable temperatures Saturday night. And on the five-day forecast there, you see Sunday, which I would say will be the nicer of the two weekend days. A little cooler, but a fair amount of sunshine, and mainly in the 30s. So one more real warm day, at least for now. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mark, John? Well, he was, uh, he was one of the Beatles. He was mm -hmm. the uh, lead member of Wings. And tonight, the world knows him simply as Paul. We're going back to the Worcester Centrum and Debbie Emblem in just a minute for more McCartney to come. Society for Barbershop Quartet and Choruses will be holding their annual concert on February 10th in Framingham. Well, you got to give him credit. 26 years in the limelight, and, well, he's still giving it all. Paul McCartney bringing down the house tonight in Worcester. Among the ticket holders, our own arts and entertainment reporter, Debbie Emblem. Debbie? In two words, in two words, very impressive. The uh, two-and-a-half-hour show kicked off tonight with a 10-minute film covering 25 years of Paul McCartney's musical history, as well as 25 years, really, of world events. Well, then Paul and his five-member band opened um, with a tune called Figure of Eight from their latest album. The show began on a slight downbeat. Although fans embraced tunes from McCartney's new album, things really picked up as soon as he and his band delivered a string of older hits from Ebony and Ivory to Can't Buy Me Love. At age 47, McCartney is in excellent voice and form. Belting out songs and jumping about, despite the touches of gray and crow's feet, he's still the cute beetle. <laughs> The string of hits were great, as was the band's ability to turn out old favorites, redone with fresh arrangements and harmony. Especially impressive was Hamish Stewart, whose voice did musical justice to the old gems and the new ones. Four massive hanging speakers provided terrific sound, while striking computer laser light action had the crowd screaming. Some aspects were a little too commercial for me, like the flower background that appeared during some of the new songs from the Flowers in the Dirt album, but the concert, well rehearsed and presented, was first rate. It's a good Very show, good man. Show. Very really good, good show. show. Great concert. We love Paul McCartney. We loved it. 26 years ago, I took her to the Beatles. And this is the second time we went. It was dynamite. It was unbelievable. One of the best shows I've seen this year. If you're wondering why uh, there was only one song, or pretty much one song that you happened to see in this piece, it was because they only allowed us to shoot one song. Incidentally, Paul McCartney did have a press conference scheduled for tomorrow afternoon, but it was canceled, and uh, his press people say that it was because he wanted to save his voice and save his throat for his upcoming concerts, unfortunately. I also, when I was at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston uh, yesterday, the, the people involved there said that Paul McCartney had called them to ask them if he could see the show, but they simply couldn't arrange a time to accommodate him. So I guess big stars sometimes don't always get their way, but I think the audience had their way tonight. They were very, very happy with the terrific show. Kate? Uh, did uh, McCartney, Debbie, speak much with the crowd? Did he have much interaction with the crowd, or was it primarily singing? Actually, uh, there was, yeah, there really wasn't much depth to his conversation. He didn't have a lot to say, although he did dedicate Fool on the Hill to uh, three of his mites, as he said, of course, Ringo, George, and John. But the depth really came in the, the, the beautiful music, and uh, we bathed in this wonderful, warm nostalgia. It was a terrific, terrific concert. And, of course, it will be same time, same place tomorrow night, sold-out show. And uh, reporting live from the uh, Worcester Centrum, Debbie Amblum. Back to you, Kate. All right, thank you very much, Debbie. I like George best. <laughs> Mark? Thursday night, and, uh, well, there's some action at the Garden tonight, too. The Bruins earned their paychecks. Yeah, Bruins did what they're supposed to do. That is, the good teams are supposed to beat the bad ones. And it was tryout day for 40-year-old Billy Buckner. How did it all turn out? We'll show you straight ahead in sports. Well, while they were rocking at the Centrum to Paul McCartney, they were rocking to the Bruins at the Boston Garden tonight. Yeah, good reviews down at Boston Garden as well. They did what they were supposed to do, Mark. When you're bruised and battered as the Boston Bruins are, even a perfunctory performance to produce a 5-1 win 
over the worst team in hockey is certainly a welcome sight. The timing could not have been better for the arrival of the woeful Quebec Nordiques. They cooperated politely tonight to the tune of a four-goal Bruin win as the best team in hockey beats down the worst. Let's head for Boston Garden. Just 38 seconds into the hockey game, the returning Bob Sweeney shot is saved by Millen, but recently recalled Peter Duras is there for the Bruin lead. Later in the first, Duras gets involved again, this time behind the net, feeding John Carter his 10th. It's 2-0 now. Reggie Lemelin had his act together. Nice glove save on Jeff Jackson, turning back 21 of the 22 shots he faced. Second period now. Bruins score twice in 16 seconds. Quintal, slap shot, his second of the year, and then this from Glenn Wesley. Behind the net, Carpenter had to put it in front. Back for Wesley. Oh, Wesley, a shot. Wesley fired in the Atlanta wrist shot to make it quickly 4-0 for Boston. Ah, but Reggie would lose the shutout midway through the second. Ken McRae steals the puck from Peterson and beats Lemelin, ending Boston's 104-minute shutout streak. No big deal. Cam Neely adds his 39th in the third on the power play. Bruins win their 34th game, 5-1 over Quebec. Finals on the scoreboard. The Bruins' Adams division lead is back to five over Buffalo. Chicago beats Detroit by two. Mario rolls on 44 straight games with either a goal or an assist. He got one goal and four assists tonight. Pittsburgh beats Washington. Islanders and Philadelphia a 5-5 tie. The Celtics have already commenced their all-star break, and when that concludes next week, they'll begin that brutal eight-game Western road trip with two in Texas. Tonight, the Sixers trail the Magic by two. Time running out. Gerald Henderson's left-handed layup makes it a 99-99 ball game. But at the other end, Miami's Reggie Theus will wear the hero's hat with a buzzer-beating jumper to give the Heat a two-point win. After 12 straight victories, Philly has lost two in a row. Final, New York beats Golden State. Patrick Ewing with 22. Clippers over Washington as Bernard King scores 37 in a losing effort. Orlando beats Philadelphia. Or is that Miami? Make that Orlando beats Philadelphia. Cleveland over Miami. Utah beats Charlotte. Atlanta breaks their six-game losing streak with a win over Houston. The Pistons have now won nine in a row tonight over Milwaukee. It was Indiana five points better than San Antonio. Dallas over Minnesota. And in the third, Denver beats Chicago. Leads Chicago 87-75. At a top-secret location and with outsiders very much unwelcome, Red Sox scouts Sam Mealy and Frank Malzone put 40-year-old Bill Buckner through his tryout today. Gary Gillis was there to watch the physically fit first baseman try to demonstrate his value to the Red Sox organization. Man on third, one out. Double left set. Mealy and Malzone watched Buckner take his cuts against Walter Riniak, but that was not the primary purpose for this visit. Something else was afoot, or ankle to be more specific. He's running a lot better than I've seen him before. I, I scouted Billy Buckner when he was with the Cubs. And he's running better now than it. Well, he did today, let's, let's put it that way, than I had seen him before. We can pretty good workout. Right to left, balls hit slow, running backwards, uh, stop short, start again. And he's, his legs are much better. Uh, there's no doubt about it. He ran a, ran a track. He, he was not hobbling. He was, it's amazing how he got him that good, I'll tell you. It would appear that the scouting report to those that will make the decision on whether to invite Buckner to spring training will be favorable. But those that will make the decision were not in attendance. Do you wish that Joe had been here today? Oh, definitely, yeah. It would have definitely been nice because, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've got something to show. I, you know, I feel great. Uh, I know that I can do the job and I could be there, uh, you know, waiting. I, I'd do anything for Joe, you know, pinch hit. I can play the outfield, play, uh, you know, play first base, you know, fill in DH. I mean, I... Yeah. I feel like good I can help him out in any way I can, and I'd love to help him. I'm going to throw a little set and tell him exactly what happened. All right, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank take you. It easy. Bill Buckner wanted the Red Sox to come and take a look, and maybe they figured, what do we have to lose? But maybe they left thinking, what have we got to gain? And if that's the case, then Buckner has accomplished something. Gary Gillis, Sports 7. And as for the Red Sox official position on the Bill Buckner tryout, General Manager Lou Gorman told me tonight, no comment. In sports shorts, former Buffalo Bills nose tackle Fred Smurlis hopes to continue his football career with either the Patriots or the 49ers. Holy Cross football's offensive coordinator Dan Allen is the new head coach at Boston University, where he hopes to expand on the Terriers' run-and-gun offensive philosophy. You have a lot of fun, not only in the game, but in practice, too. And, you know, as you, in your type of job, if you're not having fun, you don't want to do it. So we're going to have fun in practice, and, and hopefully it carries over to the game. I am thrilled the death be named the head coach here and uh, just hope I can do half as good a job as, as I've done in the past but 
a lot of hard work. Hopefully, it'll come through. And in college basketball tonight, top-ranked Missouri loses to Kansas State, 65-58. Bruins win. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us tonight on this edition of News 7 New England. From all of us here at Channel 7, I'm Kate Sullivan. And I'm Mark Weil. And tonight for R.D. Saul, don't forget, News 7 Daybreak at 6 a.m. Have a good night. Good night.